Hello everyone, uh, may I please introduce Dr. Paul Pistol here and who will deliver a talk about Earth's abundant child cardinal symphium cell cells. So Paul um, has dedicated his research activities to the development of synfilm PV devices, catalyzation of synfilm PV devices, and also transfer the relevant technology into the industry partner. Paul did his PhD uh, at uh, HZB at Berlin, and also got his uh, PhD in 2009 at the Free University at Berlin. His PhD work is mainly on the developing the buffer layer by dry method for the child copyright CIGS cell cells. After that one, um, Paul continued to focus, focus on optimization of the child copyright uh, CZGS and CZGSE solo cells. After that one, Paul joined uh, Martin Luther University and uh, he's in charge of uh, working on the phase formation mechanism of, of uh, pyrovascite, child copyright, castrate, and also child copyright absorber materials by the in situ XRD method. He is currently got a um, Marie Curie fellow, research fellow at uh, IRAC in Spain. He is trying to work on uh, explore the new research uh, strategies and also new materials to maximize the efficiency of cashier and synthium cell cells. Please join me to welcome Paul for this talk. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and thanks everybody for coming. Um, also thank you for inviting me on my talk on thin film photovoltaics and um, the work that we are currently doing at the IREC in Spain. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge um, the Marie Curie actions of the European Commission. I'm currently funded, I received funding from a project that is called JumpCast. This is an individual Marie Curie fellowship. Um, this enabled me to join the PV team at IREC um, to collaborate in some outstanding research, I think, to extend my network and to, uh, to, to meet some really great people. So for me, this was a very really great opportunity. Um, I would also like to thank my wife and family who came with me and enabled me to do so. So these Marie Curie actions enable researchers to develop their research career in different stages from inside Europe and outside Europe. So if you're interested in some more details, I can give you some more information about this program afterwards. So with this, I come to the outline of my talk. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about thin film photovoltaics at the beginning. So um, different technologies that are out there at the moment. Um, so why I believe in thin film PV um, in contrast to, to wafer-based silicon technologies and the different technologies, materials that are, um, that are there. Then we're going to talk about the solar energy materials and systems group at IREC, um, the presentation of the group, the institute, the main research lines, and some examples of the, of the current research that we are doing. Then we'll focus on the castroid solar cell with some different points there. Um, at the end of my talk, I will come to one special feature that we have discovered lately, um, which is um, that incorporating a small amount of germanium into our devices boosts the efficiency very, 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 very strongly. And I'm going to develop a little bit on this. And finally, of course, I'll come to the conclusions. So you see at the top, if you fall asleep or you just get lost during the talk, at the top you see the, the chapters of the talk, so you can see how much is still um, on there and um, where, where we are at the moment. So the current PV technologies, uh, most of you are going to be familiar with this. These are the wafer-based silicon technologies, um, which are more or less rigid. Um, they're cut off of blocks or of ingots. And um, this is the most mature technology with the highest efficiencies, um, very long lifetimes. And you can differentiate between the monocrystalline silicon and the polycrystalline silicon. The newer technologies are the thin film photovoltaics. Uh, these consist of the deposition of thin films um, onto a substrate. So you have a, um, a small choice of the substrate that you have available for the, for the deposition. Um, they have a relatively high cost reduction potential um, and they are characterized by low energy payback times. So the different materials that are, all that are out there um, are amorphous silicon, cadmium telluride, and CIGS or chalcopyrite. Then there are the emerging PV um, technologies. These are classified as promising, but uh, still relatively immature technologies uh, with new materials or new concepts. Um, and they have normally efficiency or stability issues that are still to be solved and they're not uh, in the market um, that much. So for this technology class, I bundle the organic PV, dye sensitized solar cells, quantum dot solar cells, and the new merge perovskites, which does, which do show the high efficiencies, 
but I still have um, some, some stability issues to solve until they can um, get higher market shares. So here's an overview of the different technologies and the state of the art where, where they are at the moment. Um, starting with the silicon technology, you have the monocrystalline with um, record lab cell efficiencies of 25.6%. Um, and these um, go over to record model efficiencies well above 20%. Um, the highest commercial modules out there in the market right now are just above 20%, 21.5%. 21, 21, you have the global productions there also. Multicrystalline has a little bit lower efficiency um, with 21.3%. The highest commercial mod module efficiencies out there at the moment are around 16, 17 um, percent. So the newer thin film technologies um, are here. You have the cadmium telluride, the CIGS, and the amorphous silicon um, with efficiencies for the cadmium telluride and the CIGS well above 20 percent also in the, in, the, in the lab, 22. Um, these translate to record module efficiencies in the range of 18.6 percent for the cadmium telluride. Um, and 16.5 for CIGS, and the highest commercial values are a little bit lower, especially for the CIGS, um, cadmium telluride 16.4 and um, CIGS around about 15 percent. Amorphous silicon has efficiencies much lower, um, record efficiency of 13.6, and the um, commercially available um, are around 10 percent. So you also see the global production 2014, which is the latest data that I've got for this. Um, where you see that most, or nearly a third of the, of the production of the worldwide global PV, PV production um, is based on monocrystalline silicon. More than half of it is multicrystalline and only roughly about 10% um, is designated to the, to the thin film technologies. Um, the lowest shares for the amorphous silicon it is actually decreasing um, mainly because of the low efficiencies of the amorphous silicon. So thin film technologies use a very low, low, uh, low amount of material to deposit these thin films because they have a very high absorption coefficient. Um, they're characterized through these low energy payback times and you can extend them to very in, in many different substrates. Um, and they have achieved already very low module prices of around 40 um, euro cent per watt peak, um, which is comparable, more or less comparable to the silicon technologies, um, but at a much lower production um, level than the silicon devices. So why I believe in thin films is that uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm going to th go through this very quickly. Um, first of all, they add a high aesthetic value to the product. Um, you can see here um, the integration of CHS solar modules in the BAPV facade from months. Um, an old module from Soltecture, you see that the modules are very homogeneous, have a black appear exper uh, um, appearance and with these small stripes and are not so unhomogeneous like with the silicon wafers that are bundled together in the module. This is especially important for design-driven projects or for BIPV applications, for example. You can choose the substrate. As I, as I said, you can deposit the active material directly onto a substrate and you can choose the substrate. You can take glass as, um, as normal, but you can also use flexible substrates like stainless steel or polymers. You could also use ceramics, which you see here um, is an example for um, thin film technology on ceramics, um, where you can do something like solar tiles for rooftop applications. You can also use very lightweight um, substrates, which enables you to take advantage of um, low weight statics of um, some hangar buildings and things like that. Or you can do stripes that you just adhese on, 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 on roofs or on, 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 on um, um, aluminum, uh, aluminum slides or things like that. You have a relatively high co cost reduction potential because you have um, some intrinsic properties that are beneficial. You can do monolithic integration instead of this wafer <laughs> integration that you have for the silicon technologies. If you use flexible substrates, you can go to road roll processing, with it, which, has a, which enables a very high throughput um, and um, has some advantages at, at the time of transporting the materials. Um, and as I said, you have a very low material consumption and can deposit the active materials on very large areas, which give you a a scaling uh, potential for the reduction of the costs. And this monolithic integration especially enables you to be relatively flexible with the size and shape of your model. So you can even make customized modules for, for customized products like um, portable electronics or, or solar harvesting devices. So this is um, not so easily done with, um, with wafer-based technologies where you have a 
uh, a fixed size for your solar cells. So the main materials out there is the amorphous silicon, as I said. Um, they're a very low cost, as has been demonstrated. This is the solar cells that you normally find in your um, solar-powered calculators, for example. Um, it's made up by Earth-abundant materials, but um, it has some instability problems at the beginning, which stabilizes them. And the main issue is that the medium efficiencies um, are making it not so competitive in the market at the moment. There's the cadmium telluride um, technology, which has shown very high efficiencies, um, is long-term stable, and has demonstrated very low cost. I think it's one of the um, less expensive technologies that are out there in the market at the moment. Um, but it has two problems. One is tellurium is a scarce uh, element. The other is that you employ cadmium, which is toxic and um, contaminant. So there's some concerns on um, in regard of this material. So the third material that is commercially available at the moment is CIGS. It also has shown a very high efficiency at a relatively low cost, not as low as the cadmium telluride. Um, but it also contains indium and gallium as scarce elements. Um, so there are some um, if you think at the current production levels, it's not a big issue, but if you think of extending the PV production um, to be an, a significant amount of their um, worldwide energy production, you have to think of terawatt levels, and then this, has to, this means that you have to um, increase the PV production of these thin film uh, materials by two orders of magnitudes. And if you go to these levels, um, the, the ability of the materials, the abundance of the materials um, can, get, can be an issue. So one of the materials that is an alternative to this is castrite, kappa zinc tin selenide, kappa zinc tin sulfide. And this is the material that we are mainly working on, that we are making mainly focusing on in, at IREC in our um, PV group. So I'm going to introduce you the institute and the group a little bit. Um, this is the Catalonian Institute for Energy Research, where I'm currently, currently working at. Um, it was founded in 2008. We're located in Barcelona, um, and the aim is to uh, create a more sustainable future for the energy. The main research activities are um, research for technology, technology development, so relatively close to industry mainly. There are different areas covering the use of energy, wind power, biomass, um, energy efficiency, and thermal um, energy in buildings. I am part of the Department of Advanced Materials of Energy, and the group uh, where I'm working is called the Solar Energy Materials and Systems Group. So here's a picture of our group. Um, of all the group members. Um, the head of our group is Alejandro Perez Rodriguez, here in the middle. And we have Edgardo and Victor, who are responsible for the um, preparation and characterization lab, uh, respectively. Uh, we have, at the moment, six experienced researchers and um, six PhD students and two technicians working in the group. So basically, there are three, me three main research lines um, within our group. Um, one is the development of high-efficiency castrite solar cells. Um, we do engineering of all the different device components, uh, mainly focused on the high-efficiency castrites, um, copper, copper zinc tin selenide and copper zinc tin sulfur selenide, and also the pure copper tin um, sulfides. So this is one of the main research lines that we have. Another one is the development of new materials and device concepts. So we investigate many different um, copper-based trichogenides. Um, we, do, we, we, we try to investigate new absorber alloys, um, alternative buffer layers, alternative substrates, um, and also some new device concepts like bifacial or semi-transparent um, devices. Then the main pillar, um, where the group actually comes from, from um, historically, um, is a very strong focus and a very strong um, expertise in Raman-based Raman um, methodologies, Raman-based spectroscopy. And here, um, the line is to develop advanced characterization methodologies um, to do process monitoring or process control and quality control in trichopyrite technologies in close collaboration with many different industrial partners from the trichogenite um, industry. So my main focus of the talk today will be the first point. I will just give a few examples of the um, second and the third line to give you a little bit an idea of, of what is going on about. So one is this process and qual quality control. Here we can see um, the process steps that a normal um, trichoid pirate solar cell uh, or a module would undergo in industrial, um, in an industrial production. You see the architecture of the solar cell um, on the left side. You can see that the glass comes in, it's going to be washed, and then you have a sequence of different deposition and structuring steps within this process um, 
until the module at the end comes out here, is encapsulated and measured. You can assign to each of these process steps a certain process yield, which means um, that, the, that the module either um, goes through the, through the process um, in a good way or is damaged by the process. Most of these processes have um, um, process yields well above 99%. Um, the most crucial one is the one of the absorber, where the absorber is deposited, and um, which is shown here at this, uh, this part. And you can imagine, um, as this is the most crucial part, it's very important to have a very good process control here. Um, you can, with, with, if you increase the, the yield at this step um, only by a few percent, it may not sound too much, but if you look at a, if you think of a gigawatt production, um, this corresponds to, to hundreds of thousands of modules that you um, that you do not have to toss away in a year. So this is a cost factor that's quite important. So there are two things that you have to bear in mind. Either you can do a process control where you um, put a process control tool within in situ into the reaction chamber or where you are located there, or you put it online just behind the reaction of the absorbers with a very fast feedback loop. So you can actually control the, uh, adjust the deposition parameters um, right after the deposition or the following modules. Um, so this way you can um, get up the process yield, which is, um, which is beneficial for the, for the production costs. Um, but you can also, uh, if you after this step, introduce a quality control, um, you don't have to process the, most, the module until the end. So you um, save all the process steps that are going through until the end where the module is measured. So, so you can take out the module at this point already um, and can save lots of money. So this is actually something that's um, common for all uh, fabrica for our industrial fabrication process, but it's especially important for thin film photovoltaics because on the one hand side, you're depositing on very large areas. Um, you deposit very thin films with um, alloy composition, so it's very important to, to um, control very well the composition and the thickness of your layers. Um, but it's also, if you have, as you have the monolithic integration, um, if you have one corner of your module that is bad, you have to toss away the whole module. And it's not with, as with the silicon wafers, for example. You can just sort the silicon wafers when they come out and just take the good ones. Um, in this case, you have to be sure that the whole module, the whole area, and these large areas is um, coated <coughs> in the same way. So this is why um, process monitoring and, and, and quality control is important in thin film photovoltaics. And where the IREC is strong is in Raman spectroscopy. Um, this is a nice tool because it's non-destructive, fast, um, and contactless. It um, can assess different layers of the solar cell. Um, so actually with Raman spectroscopy, you probe the atomic vibrations um, in a crystal. So um, this makes it sensitive to the, to the crystal structure and the, all the components that compone the, the, the crystal structure. So you can, have, um, you can probe the composition of the, of the layers. Um, you can um, if you go into resonant conditions, you can very sensitively detect secondary phases. Um, you have also some ability to detect, to detect defects or stresses. And for very thin layers, you also um, can monitor the thickness. In a spatial um, resolution of um, micrometers, um, and as I said, it's relatively fast. So you can, you can uh, detect the crystal structure, even for uh, structures that are um, have the same composition, but just um, a different symmetry, like in the case of the chalcopyrite and the copper gold um, structure. And um, yeah, you can detect the alloying and the composition of the different layers. We use it a lot in, in castoroids, because in castoroids, secondary phases have a main importance. Um, secondary phases like zinc selenide, there it's very difficult to detect the zinc selenide with other methods, um, because, for example, in XRD, the peaks are very similar to the castoroid phase. But with Raman, we developed a methodology um, where it is possible to detect the, the secondary phase in very small amounts. So the second main um, line is the development of substrate and applications. Um, the main or the general, the, 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 typical, uh, the typical substrate is soda lime glass, which is characterized by its very, very nice mechanical properties and the thermal properties. It is contains some alkali metals, um, which are beneficial for the chalcopyrite or, chalc or, or the, the castrite um, absorber growth. And um, with this, you get very high efficiencies for the castrites, for example. Um, the world record is at 12.6, and we, had we are at 10.6. But as I told you, thin films enable you to develop different applications. So we're going to alternative substrates also. 
Um, we're looking at ceramic cups of substrate, at steel foils or at polyamide foils. Um, these have some disadvantages um, with respect to the soda lime glass because they're not so flat. They don't have um, alkalis maybe. They have some, some of them have impurities that, are, that can be detrimental for the device performance. Um, but still they enable many new applications um, as I've outlined at the beginning. So we're um, currently investigating quite intensely these, um, these different alternative substrates. And it's one example um, is the work of Nacho. He's uh, developing solar cells on ceramic tiles. Um, the ceramic tiles, as per se, when they're, when, they're, when they're just fabricated, are very rough. They have impurities um, and they do not have any alkalis. So in this project, what we did with an industrial partner, um, they were covered uh, from our industrial partner with the vitreous, vitreous enamel. Um, and this vitreous enamel acts as a diffusion barrier for the impurities. It smoothens out the surface and it actually acts as a Kali source also because there's some sodium oxide incorporated in there. In the first attempt, you could achieve um, efficiencies of 5.6%, um, depending a little bit, depending only very little on the, on the content of, so of the sodium oxide in the vitreous enamel. But um, by improving the annealing conditions, um, we <coughs> pushed the efficiencies up to 7.5%. Um, as you can see here, here's the picture of the solar cells, and you can see that the ceramic cells in this um, run um, had a very similar um, efficiency to the solar lime glass um, reference. So we are just started working on polyimides also. These are extremely light and flexible. Um, they have a very low surface roughness um, and do not contain any metallic impurities, which is good for the solar cell fabrication. Um, they are quite stable mechanically. But they have some, um, some disadvantages also because they don't have the alkalis again. Um, and they limit, they limit the process temperature to temperatures below 500 degrees. Um, so we try to incorporate some doping strategies to deposit the alkali metals before we, um, we, before we synthesize the absorber. Um, and with, we, with this, we have some preliminary results um, where we obtained an efficiency of 4.4% um, for these very flexible and very light um, substrates. So with this, is, with this, I will come to the more general part uh, on the castrate solar cells. Um, I will introduce you the standard architecture of these cells for the ones that are not so familiar with these type of devices. It's a thin film device that is um, normally deposited on the soda lime glass. We have a metallic um, back contact, which is made of molybdenum. And then we have the absorber, the active material, which absorbs light, which is the castrate. Um, and then we have a thin buffer layer and a TCO front contact. So the PN junction in this, uh, in this case is uh, made up by the P-type absorber and the very strongly doped um, front contact, which is the end part of the junction. So there has been some um, very intense work in, at IREC in the past um, where, where they in, in a combined effort they, made, um, they improved the interfaces of these devices very much. Um, this is not going to be part of my talk today. Um, so I just summed this up. So they developed some etching processes to remove secondary phases and to passivate the absorber surface. Um, they made some post-demosition annealing optimization where they actually found that you get this reordering of, of, of the copper sink at the absorber surface, which is beneficial for the device performance. Um, there was some optimization of the buffer layer included and um, a strong engineering of the back contact. So there's a mul multiple, um, contact, multi -metal, multi -metal layer back contact of molybdenum. Mm -hmm. Um, has been developed. And with this, with all these engineerings, um, the device efficiency of the, of the, of the castorite solar cells at IREC um, went up to 8.3%. 8, 8 so this is more or less the starting reference um, for, the, for the things that I'm going to do into later on um, concerning the germanium. So I would like to um, introduce you of the, of the standard processing at IREC, how we process the, the solar cells. So we start with the solar lime glass, um, onto which we deposit the molybdenum back contact by DC magnetron sputtering. Um, on top of this, we deposit the copper zinc, copper tin um, layers. And um, in some of these cases, we deposit the germanium nanolayer by thermal evaporation. I will come to this point a little bit um, more in detail later on. So after this, the metallic precursor stack um, is going to this tubular furnaces that you can see here um, in a graphite box, where it's heated up to temperatures um, in a two-step um, process up to 550 degrees in, a in an atmosphere containing selenium and tin. And this way, um, the absorber is formed 
um, with some secondary phases at the surface, uh, mainly zinc selenide. These are etched away. And the next step, um, in a two-step process also, um, these remove the secondary phase, the zinc selenide, and passivate the surface a little bit. Then you deposit the buffer layer, the CDS, um, in a chemical bath, and finally deposit the front contact, the icing oxide TCO, uh, TCO um, by magnetron sputtering again. So now the, the device is, is, is ready for characterization, and we have a lot of um, standard techniques available there, but also some uh, more advanced or more specialized techniques like Raman spectroscopy. Um, we also have access to some facilities at the University of Barcelona. So here's the crystal structure of the um, castrite, copper, zinc, tin, selenide. It's derived from the schalkopite structure for copper indium selenide, for example. If you take every second indium, if you replace every second indium atom by a zinc atom and the other um, indium atom by a tin atom, you get to this castrite structure. You can see that there are different planes containing copper tin or copper zinc atoms. And actually, theoretical calculations um, demonstrate that there's a very energy involved when you replace the, uh, when you exchange the position of the copper and zinc. <coughs> so at room temperature, you would expect uh, a certain degree of disorder between this copper and zinc atoms. Um, and this is one of the um, hypothetical reasons that the efficiency in, in castorite solar cells is relatively low. Um, if you compare the efficiency of castorite solar cells to the other established technologies, uh, which is done here in this chart, here um, the open circuit voltage is um, plotted against the band gap. Um, you can see that the voltage deficit, which is um, a measure of the, of the um, which is the difference between the band gap and the maximum open circuit voltage that you achieve with these devices, this voltage deficit is rather low, uh, rather high for the for the castorites. Um, if you compare it for with CIGS, for example, where the um, voltage deficit is only uh, 400 millivolt, for the castorites, the voltage deficit is generally in the order of um, 550 to 600. So there's a, one of the reasons that the efficiency is so low that the, you lose a lot of voltage due to recombination in your cell. Um, this is something that has to be, th this is the, the, the main thing that has to be improved um, for the castorite technology in order to get efficiency that are um, co um, comparable to the CIGS or cadmium telluride or, or, or other high efficiency. So there are different um, theories on why the, why the voltage is um, so low in relation to the band gap for the castrides. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here. One is that there's um, a high amount of interface recombination or there's band gap fluctuations. Um, one, of these, one of the reasons for these could be these copper zinc disorders that I have talked um, already about. Um, but then there's another one, which is that you have a very high, um, low quality bulk material. So you have a lot of recombination in the bulk. This could be related to deep defects or to secondary phases that are incorporated into the material. Um, or recombination at the grain boundaries, for example. So this is something that is going to be more in the scope of the talk now. So um, for the cadmium telluride and CIGS, both obtained efficiencies above 22%. Um, at least in part, um, you can assign these high, very high efficiencies to the ability of these two materials to, to um, build graded band gaps for the absorber which enhances a lot the charge carrier collection um, and reduces the interface recombination. So one of the main efficiency improvements for these two materials in the last years were that they uh, were, were very, um, very detailed tuning of the band gap. So the question is if this can be achieved for castroids also. Um, the, ba castroid, the band gap of castroid can easily be um, changed or tuned um, by exchanging the cations, for example, the tin um, by different elements or the anions. So here there's a list um, of different um, ranges for the band gap. If you um, change, interchange the selenium and the sulfur um, anion, for example, or you interchange the tin by the germanium or silicon by the tin, or you can interchange, exchange the zinc by the cadmium or the copper by the, th by the silver. So you can see here that you can vary the band gap of the material of these alloys between one and approximately 3.6 electron volt. Um, so you have some abilities and it's a, um, an intense um, focus of the research in castrides right now um, to tune the band gap in some way. 
And this brings me to the, the starting point when we started with the germanium. Uh, actually, we started the germanium research uh, because we wanted to tune the band gap uh, with germanium. We'll later s you will later see that we didn't tune the band gap, but we uh, still saw a lot of um, very beneficial effects of the germanium. So we'll give you a short overview about the literature uh, for germanium in castride devices. So the first to develop these uh, germanium alloying within the castrides were the, was the IBM group. Um, they got a little um, achievement, they got a little improvement on the efficiency um, up to 9.1 percent um, and they, they, they used the hydrazine uh, processing of the cadmium zinc, tank, cadmium zinc tin selenide. They didn't see any improvement of the voltage, voltage deficit, however. Then there was a work from the Yonsei University in Korea where they actually used germanium um, to grade the band gap of the castride absorber. They made a band gap grading with an increasing band gap towards the back contact. And this, uh, this allowed them to achieve uh, an, an efficiency improvement at relatively low efficiency levels from 4.8% to 6.3%. At least they proved the concept that it is possible in castride solar cells to make a band gap grading and, uh, with germanium and that this is, po uh, this is uh, beneficial for the, for the device efficiency. There was a work of um, Hill House from the University of Washington um, where they achieved the highest efficiency so far uh, for these germanium alloys with 11%, with a relative germanium content of 25%. Um, know, yes. So if you sum up these, there, there are more uh, literature, there's more literature on this um, germanium alloying in the, out there at the moment. If you sum them up, you can see that there are some you see some increase in the open circuit voltage, um, but this is in some cases just linked to the higher band cap. If you incorporate germanium into the device, you get a higher band cap. Um, you have the great potential for band cap grading concepts, um, and you have seen some reports on the improved grain growth and the crystallinity. Um, you get uh, increased minority charge carry lifetime. So you see that the large potential to reduce the VOC deficit. But all these, um, the, all these approaches, um, involve relatively large amounts of germanium. And germanium also is a scarce element, so evolving large amounts of germanium is not so um, beneficial for your technology in a, from an industrial point of view. So at IREC, we just started um, with a very, very small amount of germanium, which is still there. I mean, you still have the, the scarce amount of germanium, but we use nanolayers. So we use um, layers in the order of between 5 and 50 nanometers. Um, so you can use a lot of, you can produce still a, a very large amount of um, photovoltaic devices with it. So the first approach was to deposit the germanium on top of it. Um, the actual idea was to increase the band gap at the surface a little bit. Um, we just deposit different amounts of germanium on top um, from non, no germanium up to 50 nanometers. And this standard process um, just on top of the metallic precursors and uh, before the salinization, then the whole metallic precursor stack with the germanium on top went to the salination oven. And what we got there um, was this curve. Can you see the efficiency as a function of the germanium nanolayer thickness? So you see that there's a very um, strong bump in the efficiency. You get an, an optimum at the, uh, for thicknesses about between 5 and 15 percent. You see an, uh, a jump in the efficiency of nearly 2 percent, uh, of nearly 2 percent points. This is um, due to an improvement on all solar cell, cell parameters, not only the VOC, which improves um, quite strongly with 50 millivolt also. But you see also an improvement in the fill factor and the uh, short circuit current density. So we had a look at the um, EQE of these devices, and you see that for increasing germanium concentration, you see an increase um, of the photo-generated current collection for the longer wavelengths. So these are the photons that are uh, generating charge carriers um, relatively deep within the absorber. Um, so you get an improved charge carrier collection here. Um, but then again, we started to look at the absorbers. We didn't see any change in the band gap uh, for the absorbers. So neither from the EQE nor from PL measurements, we see any change in the band gap, what was what we expected. Um, so we started to think that uh, maybe there was no germanium incorporated in the absorbers. So I was, we were puzzled about that. So we, we asked us two questions. So where is germanium? Where is it located and why? Um, can such low amounts of germanium actually improve the cell efficiency by, by, by 2 percent points? So we went on the quest to find the germanium. <coughs> so here you see a um, TEM overview of a sample that was pr processed with a 10 nanometer, uh, 10 nanometer germanium uh, layer on top of the um, metallic precursors. 
you see this relatively large grains at the at the surface and these small voids and the small crystallites at the at the bottom and we then started to look for the germanium with many different um, technologies here you see an, an, an zoom in into one of these regions you can see these small dots here um, in this region between this um, this relatively this region with a the relatively grow um, with a relatively um, large crystals and the region where you have the small crystals you see these little dots and if you um, look further into it and make an um, elemental mapping of this of this um, of this part you see that here you have some small uh, germanium oxide inclusions which uh, you can see here and here and these are actually the only proof or the only um, the only indication that we have at but now that germanium uh, of the germanium inside these absorbers. So we couldn't detect any germanium within the castrite. We only could see these very small germanium oxide inclusions. That's the only evidence that we have for the germanium uh, within the material, actually. But we see, if you compare here, um, different um, scanning electron micrographs of the device with and without germanium, you can see that the germanium actually improves the um, crystal, crystal size of the surface near region especially um, very largely you see very large crystals here for the um, micrograph with 10 nanometers germanium and compared to the s relatively small crystals for for the reference device so you thought up of a reaction mechanism what we think um, is going on during the reaction so we think that there's a germanium selenide phase formed um, during the selenization and this um, form this decomposes into a volatile phase that is which is lost during the uh, during the selenization and the liquid phase uh, with a high amount of selenium which acts as a crystallization agent which assists the uh, uh, crystallization of these um, of these crystal grains here so this would um, explain the germanium loss as well as the improved crystallization for the for the CCTS devices so with this and in collaboration with our uh, colleagues at IMRA we were able to um, demonstrate a device with CCTS um, that um, surpassed 10%. We got a device with 10.6% uh, with an um, anti-reflective coating. And you can see here, for example, um, the different cells on this substrate, um, that it was not just one single cell, but the whole substrate got, got, got efficiencies of 10% or above, um, or nearly 10% and above. So it was a very reproducible and very homogeneous process um, that lead to this uh, and led to this very very nice efficiencies. So with this technology, with this germanium nanolayer, we were able to incre we were able to um, increase the open circuit voltage, the efficiency of our devices. And if you compare this to the other reported record, uh, record devices from Castrides, um, you see that we don't we haven't achieved a record for the efficiency, but we actually have were able to report the lowest um, voltage deficit um, with 550 millivolt um, reported so far. So we went, kept on looking and we're trying to figure out a little bit more what was going on here. So we made a very detailed um, TEM study of these devices with a 10 nanometer germanium on top. And you can see that there, there are very different, there are two types of grain boundaries present in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in these devices. You can see this here. There are two, grain bound two types of grain boundaries present. One is very straight grain boundaries, um, mainly deposit mainly um, at the upper part of the absorber. Uh, which are mainly vertical and the connecting the surface to the pores. And these are um, uh, the elemental um, analysis showed that these are slightly copper enriched. Then you have these meandering grain bounds, as we call them, which are more or less horizontal and um, varying and not so straight. These contain some sodium, cadmium, sulfur. So we thought um, as the germanium improves the crystallization on the top, what happens if we put the germanium on the bottom? So we tried that. Actually, if you put the germanium at the bottom, you can get rid of all these meandering grain boundaries. You see here that the uh, grain boundaries come from the top surface of the absorber just back down to the bottom. When you apply germanium here on top of the absorber and at the bottom, you can see here this is the case where you only have germanium on the top with a, a small crystallites at the bottom of the layer and these voids. If you apply germanium on the bottom order also, you get very nice, very large crystals that go through the whole absorber layer thickness um, of, of several microns. Um, diameter. So the introduction of germanium at the bottom drastically reduces the presence of these meandering grain boundaries and um, you can absorb very large grains extend over the whole thickness of the absorber. So efficiency wise it also um, 
improved our efficiency. This time we didn't make any anti-reflective coating. The, the efficiencies are a little bit lower, um, but still the introduction of a gem annulator at the bottom also has an effect of the efficiency. Um, this time, not so much on the open circuit voltage, but you improve the fill factor and the, um, the short circuit current density. <coughs> so what we think right now, what the gem annulator does, there's some interaction with the sodium. We have absorbed this also in, um, in, in, in some of the studies, but we think that it's mainly uh, forms a liquid phase or some, at, uh, at, at some germanium selenide phase that acts as a very strong crystallization agent that assists the crystallization of this, um, of this device, um, enables you to make much larger crystals, um, and this way you probably have less recombination at the grain boundaries. Um, you get much better um, device performances for these things. So with this I would like to come to my conclusions. Um, I think I've shown you why I think that thin films photovoltaics is a, has a great potential um, for a variety of applications that may be different from the standard applications where silicon technologies are, um, are concerned, including building integrated photovoltaics or flexible applications. Um, I showed you the SEM group, SEMS group at IREC, uh, with the three main research lines, um, as you remember, with the flexible approaches and um, the advanced process and quality control by Raman spectroscopy. I then talked about the CCTS solar cells, um, the material and the specific problems related to this material and the technology, um, for example, the high, the high voltage deficits, um, and I introduced in the solar cell processing and the architecture, and then um, I just uh, briefly got, I, I just briefly went through the, the boosting effect of these germanium nanolayers in our device architectures. We got device, uh, device efficiencies of up to 10.6%, um, and we think that we have some kind of crystallization agent, um, which is the germanium, um, and it helps us to crystallize the layers much better. So with this, I would like to um, finish my talk, and I uh, would be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for a very nice talk. So we can have a couple questions. Yeah, uh, thanks. R really nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, we're quite interested in life cycle assessment of yes. thin film materials, thin materials. So, so Gina might have mentioned this in your talks. But um, so I was wondering, do you envisage that the processes that you're investigating now, the type of processes you're using in the lab would be similar or the same as what would be used in mass production? Or do you have a good feel for what might be used in mass production? Do you mean the concern the price? The processes. The processes, oh okay, the processes, I, 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 I understand. Yes, I think most of the processes that we, that we currently um, use in our lab are, 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 are scalable to do much, I mean, you use buttering, which is actually already um, established as a large area. Um, this thermal leaning is not a very difficult process. Also, you just heat up the, the, the modules. Um, maybe this etching technologies and these things are a little bit more, more complicated, but there are also solutions for this in, in industrial applications. But I think these, these wet chemical processes probably would be the bottleneck in the, in the production line. Maybe there are some of the, some, some engineering has to be done still to, to make it faster and, 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 and maybe yeah, less less difficult to for the for the processing. So any other questions? Yeah. 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 I have a, I have okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, in one of the early slides uh, you showed the high efficiency table of different technologies. Yes. And uh, CIGS seems to have um, high, higher efficiency in lab scale devices than uh, cadmium telluride. But when you uh, upscale them to modules, it seems that the efficiency drops dramatically. I have no idea um, what is the reason. Is it because of the process? Probably it's because of the processing. But if it is because of the processing, what is uh, what sort of process people use that uh, mm -hmm. doesn't allow getting high efficiency in CIGS? Yeah, I think that's a very good obser observation, and uh, this is really a concern of the of the people in the CIGS community to bring up the to to to, to reduce the gap between laboratory efficiencies and 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 industrial um, scale uh, efficiencies. And I think if we would know well the the reason for this, um, everybody would try to 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 reduce the to, to reduce the gap, and it's not so it's not. 
it's not so easy to to understand. I think, I think cat material right has the has the the advantage that the process is much easier to control, and the cat material right is it's much, it's it's, um, it's eva evaporated congruently. So you have, you, you are not so with with the, the trichrome right. It's more difficult to um, to really adjust the composition in this grading at the at, at the level that you need to get these highest efficiency. So I think this is the main problem that at an industrial scale at large areas you f you encounter you face um, to translate these very very fine tuned process conditions in the lab um, to large scale industrial production yeah, so probably time for the one more question yes. oh, just following up on the life cycle analysis sort of area um, your, your device structure still contains cadmium yes um, and also I don't know is is selenium a, a rare element as tellurium is. So does it solve the issue of non-toxicity and earth abundance, really? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the cadmium is still in there. We are working on, on alternative buffer layers. Um, this is current topic of research, obviously. Um, the, the amount of cadmium that is in there is very small. You have uh, like 30 nanometers of cadmium sulfide in there, but you're right. I mean, if you want to sell the module, it's nicer to sell it cadmium-free. Um, so this is an open topic of research. Um, up to now, in the research lab, the cadmium sulfide normally gives higher efficiencies, at least for the selenide devices. If you go to the wider band gap to the sulfides, um, there you have there you have to readjust the band gap, the band alignment. And um, there, some of the alternative buffer layers are, are might be beneficial. So this is concerning the the, the cadmium. The selenide um, is not as scarce as the tellurium but it's not a material that is really, really abundant either. Um, at least at the production levels that are, uh, that are currently, um, it's not produced in, a, in very high amounts as far as I know. Um, so switching to sulfur would be the obvious alternative if you control the process very well. Um, this would be the alternative to the selenium. Up to now, the selenium is, uh, is available enough, let's say. But in the large, in the, the, in the low, in the long term view, when you go to really m many terawatt production, then you have to might have to switch to su to sulfur also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you have any further questions, you can ask them for on um, after this uh, talk, and uh, I believe Paul will be very happy to answer it. Yes. Uh, actually, I have a couple questions. <laughs> uh, so um, thanks, Paul, for a very nice talk, and please please join me to thank you, Paul. Again. Thank you.